Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Gervais Syndrome Foundation for our next educational webinar of 2023. Tonight's topic is inspiration and preparation for traveling with Gervais. This topic is timely given that summer is quickly approaching and in-person Day of Gervais workshops and our sixth biennial family and professional conference are on the horizon. We hope that you leave here tonight feeling motivated and confident about traveling with your loved one, whether it to be joined for these in-person DSF events, medical appointments, or family vacations. We'd like to start by thanking our sponsors for their support of this educational webinar series. Thank you to BioCodex, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Takeda, and UCB. This session, along with the slide deck, will be recorded and available on demand. We ask all attendees to remain muted with their videos turned off during this presentation. There will be time for Q&A, so please feel free to submit your questions to the chat box at any time. I'm Erin Riojo, your DSF Family Network Liaison and your host and moderator here tonight. My family and I live just outside of the Seattle area, and while I would not consider us experts in the field of disability travel, we have certainly racked up some healthy mileage points over the last seven years since our then two-year-old was diagnosed with Gervais syndrome. Because we live so close to a comprehensive care and major medical center, we have mainly traveled for pleasure, but that doesn't mean we don't travel without the fear of Gervais as a stowaway. We at DSF recognize that traveling, whether it be for family vacations or for medical appointments, is an exceptional privilege. We recognize that even in the absence of Dravet, there are barriers to accessible and affordable travel. If your loved one is newly diagnosed, traveling may be the last thing on your mind, or perhaps you are grieving what you thought traveling with your family would be like. Before my son began having seizures, our family had planned a, a trip to Hawaii. Just a month before departure, the results of his genetic test came back positive for an SCN1A gene mutation. Obviously, we were grief-stricken by this diagnosis, and given the unpredictable breakthrough status seizures, we had no idea how to navigate leaving the house, much less flying across the Pacific Ocean. We asked our epileptologist what we should do, and without hesitation, he said, go to Hawaii. I didn't really understand the meaning of go to Hawaii until later in our journey. He wasn't just giving us medical clearance. He was encouraging us to give ourselves permission to continue to live our lives and to make memories. Long story short, we did not in fact fly across the Pacific Ocean with a newly diagnosed two-year-old and his five-month-old sister, but we did compromise and we rerouted to take a family vacation to California. Only through the additional support and advice from parents in our online Gervais community were we able to successfully and semi-confidently take this trip. Unfortunately, there is no exact way to travel with Gervais, but we hope that you leave here tonight feeling inspired and prepared. And yes, years later, hold please while I find all my buttons. <laughs> Years later, we did make it to Hawaii. I may not be an expert on disability travel, but I am quite resourceful. I knew I couldn't present this topic on my own, so I reached out to those that could. While you may recognize them from Instagram and their social media platforms, I am so delighted to introduce our key speakers to our Gervais community here tonight. Meet Christy Cook. She is the voice behind Accessible Adventures. Christy and her husband TJ have been together for 15 years and have four amazing children. In October of 2020, they made a huge decision that changed their lives. They moved from their home state of Florida to Colorado. This decision was not something they took lightly, but their youngest son, Robbie, needed the medical care and Medicaid waivers that Colorado could offer. When they arrived in Colorado, Robbie was referred to make a wish. Robbie had been eligible since he was two years old, but they wanted to wait until they truly knew what would benefit him. Robbie lives with lennox gastaut syndrome. Like Dravet syndrome, LGS is a rare form of epilepsy that does not respond well to medications. 
He has been through almost every seizure medication, a corpus callosotomy brain surgery, a VNS implant, and multiple special diets. Unfortunately, he still lives with daily seizures, putting him at a higher risk of SUDEP, which our community knows is sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Robbie is extremely medically fragile, so when the pandemic first started, Christine and her family stopped traveling. Wishing for a camper for Robbie gave their family hope they could safely hit the road again. Once they started traveling, Christy realized there was not enough information readily available to plan wheelchair accessible adventures. She started building a community with fellow RV travelers and special needs parents. She asked them questions about places they had gone and what they thought they could handle. Shortly after, Ad Accessible.Adventures on Instagram was born. Christy hopes that their presence inspires others with all abilities to enjoy all that nature has to offer. She knows the journey of medical parenthood can be heavy, and she hopes to help cultivate a safe space for families with disabled travelers. Please also welcome Jennifer Allen. Jennifer is the voice behind Wonders Within Reach. Jennifer and her husband are parents to three wonderful children, two first graders and a fourth grader. After teaching for eight years, seven years teaching English in public school, and one year in an international school in Taiwan, Jennifer took some time off to focus on two babies and a preschooler at home. Her daughter, Nella, was a happy surprise along the adoption journey to bring her son, Jaden, home. So they affectionately call them the twins, since they're the same age. Wesley, now 10, is a self-proclaimed lover of adventure and beautiful things. After Jaden was diagnosed with spina bifida, Jennifer extended her leave to manage medical appointments and various therapies. Because of all of these appointments, they're firmly rooted in Pennsylvania, but they explore as often as they can. It didn't take Jennifer long in sharing their adventures to realize that there aren't many families that look like theirs in the travel writing industry. They love to inspire and enable families with disabilities to get out and explore while raising disability awareness along the way. Christy and Jennifer, thank you so much for joining our Gervais community here today. Before I introduce the rest of our panel, let's start with some inspiration. Christy and Jennifer, I'd like for you each to tell us a little bit more about how you got started traveling and uh, how you and your family got started traveling and what our community can learn by following along on your adventures. Christy, let's start with you. Hi, my name is Christy Cook. Um, my family is Accessible Adventures on all social media platforms. Uh, we didn't travel much when we were in Florida because of Robbie's diagnosis. And when we did, we tried to stay as close to hospitals as we possibly could. Um, when we moved to Colorado, he got a camper from Make-A-Wish and we started doing national parks. And a lot of them, if you didn't know, are kind of in the middle of nowhere. So we really had to push our boundaries of what we were comfortable with um, and started road tripping with his camper. Uh, as we began on that journey, we realized that there are a ton of places that are accessible for your family to enjoy and epic views. You just have to find them. So just because you see a national park and you see the person at the very top of that mountain with their hand in the air on Instagram, that does not mean that that is the only cool thing at that park. Um, almost every national park has something amazing to offer. And we've found that being in nature has been so healing for our family and a great way for us to just really come together. Um, and honestly, wonderful for Robbie in a therapeutic aspect. Thank you so much, Christy. And Jennifer, what about you? So we, I guess, have always been travelers. Um, my firstborn was one of those easygoing kids who didn't really impact the way that we travel. And so then with our second son, when we got the diagnosis that he wouldn't walk, um, there was kind of that initial shell shock of diagnosis. They were like, okay, what, do, what does our life look like now? And in the instant, I was thinking, well, travel is done. What are we going to do with the wheelchair? We're, we can't go hiking with the wheelchair. We can't uh, fly to Italy with the wheelchair. We can't do these things. And looking back, obviously that's ridiculous because now that I'm in the disability community and see all of these other disabled travelers who have literally been to every continent, um, we can do all of these things. It's just, we don't have that awareness. And so 
as we started to travel and we started small, our very first trip was Disney World because they have a great reputation for accessibility and for working with people with different needs. And so even with incontinence and things like that, like we knew that there were places to change, whatever, everything is fairly simple. So we started with something that we knew would be manageable and kind of started working our way up from there. Um, and in doing that, started sharing our journey because it was overwhelming to me when we had that shift in focus. And I'm hoping that in sharing our journey, other families don't have to have that same experience. Uh, I kind of want to be front and center so that when somebody gets a diagnosis of, oh, our kid has spina bifida, he's never going to walk on his own. Oh yeah, well, remember that family from Instagram who does all those travels and is able to do all those things? We could do that. <laughs> and so kind of giving some hope even just by being visible. Um, I guess one of the big things that we share as we go, you know, you can't leave the chaos behind, right? It's not like you can go on a vacation and all of your disabilities, medical needs, extra things stay behind, but you can experience all of that chaos in a much more exciting location. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's kind of what we share as we go, right? I mean, things happen. We call um, it we call that medical tourism in our family, you know, which, whether it is you, you get to see a new urgent care or whether it is, mm -hmm. you know, just getting to, to experience it's, it's the medical tourism of, of it all, whether, you know, it's the lovely side or not. Yes. And we definitely do that. I mean, we have encountered quite a few hospitals that are not our own, but, <laughs> but it's always worth it. I feel like we've never had a trip that was so awful that we came home and said, I'm done. We don't want to do it anymore. Or even that that trip wasn't worth it. We had one that was maybe a little close, but never one that was so awful that we're like, oh, we're, we're wishing we didn't do that. And that's why I invited both of you here today, because following along on your platforms, they are both just so inspiring to families to say, like, we can get out and do this. You know, Christy, I understand you all travel by camper, but that doesn't mean that's the only way that um, families can be able to access the parks. And then Jennifer, I know that you often stay close to home or that you're you know, able to do flights too, but it's just giving our families some, some inspiration and some things to think about as they go through this whole diagnostic journey. So thank you very much for both being here today. Um, now on to the rest of our panel. Uh, we're going to listen and learn from their experiences with traveling with Dravet. Both of these guests are DSF Family Network Parent Ambassadors from the West Region. Meet Melissa O'Brien. Melissa and her husband Jim are the proud parents of four boys, the youngest two pictured here. Their son Owen, now nine years old, was diagnosed with Dravet, uh, with Dravet syndrome at the age of three. Melissa and her family live in Ketchikan, Alaska. While they do enjoy all the beauty that Alaska has to offer, they additionally travel to the lower 48, both for medical care and for family vacations. Owen recently received a travel camper from Make-A-Wish. Additionally, the family looks forward to traveling to the upcoming Day of Dreamy workshop and Epilepsy Awareness Day at Disneyland in California this October. Meet Morgan Turpin. Morgan lives just north of San Diego, California with her husband, Sean, and their son and daughter. Their oldest, Shane, now 11, was diagnosed with an SCN1A gene mutation when he was 14 months old, and by the age of two years old, was diagnosed with Dravet syndrome. Their family has traveled extensively for Shane's medical care and for, for participation in multiple clinical trials. Prior to the pandemic, Shane's Make-A-Wish was granted as a Disney cruise. Morgan and her family enjoy outings to explore all the things that Southern California has to offer with favorite spots, including Legoland, the San Diego Zoo and Safari Park, and Disneyland. And yes, you will see her at the upcoming Day of Gervais workshop and Epilepsy Awareness Day at Disneyland this October. Welcome, Melissa and Morgan. Now, as we get started, I want to acknowledge our friends at Courageous Parents Network, who have many great resources about traveling with a medically complex child, including a digital or printable travel guide um, that is available on their website, and we've put uh, links in the slide deck. You can simply visit CourageousParentsNetwork.org and search travel in their resource library search bar. We're going to explore many, many topics tonight and do our best to answer your questions, but we know this hour will go fast. We encourage you to additionally explore their resources. 
And speaking of which, let's explore. Before you can fly the friendly skies, before you can hit the road, before you can set up camp, and before you can set sail on the seas, you must explore. Explore your expectations, that is. With your family, decide what is important about taking this or any trip. Share your excitement, share your worries, and share your priorities. Be flexible. Think about what destinations are desirable for your whole family. Consider the variety of lodging accommodations. Figure out what mode of transportation will work best. Traveling can be very stressful, even in the best of times. Make sure that good communication makes it on your packing list. I personally have lost too much time on vacations being upset or angry that events didn't go as planned. It's challenging when there are so many factors that are out of our control, so it's helpful to expect the unexpected. Additionally, while most of, us, most of what we are discussing here tonight is related to long distance travel within the United States, please don't disregard a staycation close to your home. One of our community members added, the ability to live life fully with a Gervais child doesn't mean putting them at risk. For some families, going to the park or town next door is travel. We at DSF completely agree. If long distance travel presents too many barriers and challenges, but your family still wants to begin exploring, think about how you might vacation in your own backyard, whether literally or figuratively. I know that our panel will share great tips on how to cherish those close to home adventures as well. At the risk of sounding up like Santa, we do encourage you to make a list and check it twice. Plan well in advance and think about all you need to make this a safe and successful trip. Begin by consulting your medical team. Asking questions and getting input from your loved one's providers is incredibly important. They can help you make medical decisions and to think about those unexpected medical challenges that may come along on your trip. They can make sure you're taken care of with all your prescriptions and equipment needs. And you may even consider asking if they have a colleague at your destination. Organize your medical information. You may consider traveling with a personalized letter from your provider, particularly if your loved one is participating in a clinical trial. Travel with your loved one's seizure action plan. In their resources, Courageous Parents Network also offers an anticipatory symptom management plan that you might find helpful. Many of our families travel with both paper and digital copies of these medical documents. Additionally, through Courageous Parents Network, I learned about a Pennsylvania-based pediatric palliative care coalition's free lightning bug app, which helps caregivers manage day-to-day -day medical details for their individual with medical complexities. While I don't have personal experience with this or other similar apps, this can be a great resource for, to digitally organize your medical information. Pack the medicine and even more medicine. Many families travel with several extra days worth of meds or even double the amount, including bridge and rescue medications. Make sure you are staying on top of your refills and that you have enough to get through your trip. It doesn't hurt to have a plan on how and where you'll get your medications refilled if needed. Keep medications in prescription bottles with identification instead of pre-filling your weekly pill cases. Consider if your medication needs to stay cool. Depending on how you'll travel, think about where this is packed and who is responsible for it. Some families keep all medication, even the extras, in one bag monitored by one adult, but some families split it between two bags. Consider non-prescription needs like Tylenol and ibuprofen, or if this can be easily obtained at your destination. Finally, consider all those other necessities, feeding, toileting, seizure monitoring, and safe sleeping. Do you need to plan around keto, mad meals and ingredients, or liquid and food thickeners, tube supplies, meal supplements such as shakes, um, and all those meals and snacks while at transit and at your destination? Make sure you have enough diaper supplies, both again for in transit and at your destination. What seizure monitoring devices do you use at home? We travel with an audio monitor and many families travel with their SAMIs. Don't forget batteries, cables, and chargers, and pack extra VNS magnets. Finally, don't forget to think about safe sleeping arrangements at your destination. Will you room share or bed share? 
packed your loved one's anti-suffocation pillow, or consider a travel safety bed. And I know Christy has some great resources for those as well. How far is too far? One of our members specifically asked, how far is too far away from a hospital? We want to go to my family's lake home. The nearest hospital is approximately 30 minutes away. In addition, many in our community question and seek advice on how to, see, how to avoid seizure triggers or how to deal with the fear of seizures while traveling. Unfortunately, no one here can exactly answer that for you, but we all advise you to prepare for challenges. Plan for a medical emergency. Remember, we all advise to expect the unexpected. Think about your seizure plan, whether in transit or at your destination. Consider whether you need urgent action, action or simply recovery time. Many of us travel with the expectation of seizures. We pack our flexibility and we do our best to manage our expectations through the various activities each day of travel. Will you be near a comprehensive care center? or perhaps other Gervais families who can advise where they seek medical attention. Where will you go for urgent or for emergency care? Are there pediatric hospitals near you or near your destination? What trauma level is the nearest hospital or where is the nearest level one trauma center and how would you get there? Do you have accessible transportation? Rideshare services may be quick and public transportation may be inexpensive but not necessarily convenient in an emergency. And always check your medical insurance coverage and consider having a conversation with your insurance and insurance representative to make sure you're covered on your journey. I want to add a quote here from one of our community members. This spring, my daughter had her make a wish to Disney and it was our first flight and long distance trip. Despite all that could go wrong, heat, other triggers, etc., only one small manageable, manageable seizure occurred. This entire experience has given us the confidence to try another long distance trip, and we're now looking at planning more. We're not going to let fear win again. I can't tell you how many times I've let fear make its way into our travel plans and that the best thing that I learned to do was just manage, uh, plan for that unexpected, expect that unexpected. Now I wanna get back to our panel since we haven't yet heard from Melissa and Morgan. Um, Melissa, which of the pieces resonated most with you and what else would you add? So I think for me, just, um, you know, planning for everything. We've been in situations where I think um, every, almost everybody on this panel um, has dealt with epilepsy. And so knowing that you have to keep seizure meds down. And so in our early state, we didn't think about traveling with like our Zofran. So our son had an episode in the hotel and got sick and wasn't able to keep the seizure meds down. So here we are at 11 trying to find, you know, an ER so we could get a prescription filled for that. And so really when we say like plan your meds, or pick your meds, bring them, bring everything thing those kind of things are important at midnight you know that you're not you're not thinking about where the nearest CVS is or something so um, there's no such thing as being too prepared for it just in case and that was that helps us travel a little bit easier just knowing that we're ready for anything that might happen and Morgan what about for you I know that you've traveled to several in-person DSF events with your family as well as extensively for Shane's medical care and for participation in clinical trials I know that's certainly not as joyful as traveling for pleasure and for vacations, but what can you share about those experiences that can help our families physically and emotionally prepare for those trips and even perhaps encourage families to consider participating in clinical trials, even if it requires long distance travel? Absolutely. I think the thought of traveling was the most overwhelming part before we did it. I think that with traveling, you gain experience, you gain wisdom, you learn from those midnight examples where you're trying to find Zofran or some other med, and you also gain confidence. And I think the more that we've done it, the better that we've gotten at doing it. We've learned all those little extra things that we need to prepare. Um, I'm a huge proponent of using TSA CARES whenever we fly. So when we were doing all of these back and forth trips up north to San Francisco for a clinical trial, 
that involved flights, we always use TSA CARES. It's a specially trained TSA officer who meets you at the entrance to security. They take us to our own private lane. It is a little bit of a different experience at different airports, but in our situation, we've used it at multiple airports and I really recommend it. You fill out a form ahead of time that gets them to know kind of what you're dealing with that's a little bit extra needs wise and just the comfort and the relaxation where they tell us, you know, take as much time as you need. My son stays in his adaptive stroller and they're just super friendly and well-versed and it makes the process so much less stressful because it's already hard enough to get through security, but especially when you add on bringing equipment and medication and formula, you know, liquids, and you have a child that you're also trying to manage and maybe even another child or two <laughs> um, in tow, it, it can be very stressful. So I highly recommend to people to utilize that service. That's, they're always thanking us for using it too, because that's what it's there for. Um, other than that, I would just say that I want to echo what Jennifer said about uh, we we do not have any trips, even though things have not always gone perfectly. There were no trips that we came home and we regretted and we said we shouldn't have done that. Um, we've always gotten something out of every single trip that we've taken. And sometimes it's more of a learning experience, but I feel like it just helps us get more prepared for next time. So, yeah, I just wanted to nail that home as well. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, let's take with what you were talking about with TSA CARES and talk about more flight tips. Um, many of our families um, do use TSA CARES. Many will have a variety of experiences. I think it's really important what you said. Um, it's going to depend on the different airport. Um, I know we used it for the first time when we recently flew back to New Mexico and um, we didn't get contacted on the in Albuquerque side. Um, so we just went through everything ourselves. But when we got up to the front, we let them know all of our um, needs and they said, no problem. Um, it doesn't mean you're not still going to get scanned for things. It doesn't mean they're not still going to go and, and look at and take extra care and looking at all of your medications, but it can just give them a heads up. And um, like you said, if there's availability for it, they can take you to a separate line. Um, or at least they have somebody assigned specifically for you. Um, so we'll keep trying that again. And I encourage our families to continue to access that. We'll make sure that you um, know how to um, seek out that information as well as looking at TSA's website for frequently asked questions for disabilities and medical conditions because they really have so much information uh, laid out right there <clears throat> about traveling. We travel with pre-sealed um, Pediasure shakes and no, we don't want to open them because then as soon as it's open, then it's, um, you know, then the expiration clock starts ticking on it. But uh, we, they can be over the, the amount of liquids and that's just something we can travel with. Um, I heard the tip too, to also consider signing up for TSA pre-check because then you can also skip some of those things about taking off your shoes and just an extra step in, um, in just kind of the ease of going through the travel. I really think about um, when we're thinking about flights specifically, all of that mobility needs and really um, thinking through how you're getting to and through the airport, because if you're driving yourself to the airport or using a ride share, really planning all the way from when you're leaving your house, um, I will say just today, um, I will call out Austin Watson. I see that they are in flight heading to um, Chicago and they, um, it was, it's just her and her son traveling, um, but they had, they were able to bring her husband through who could assist with a gate check pass. So if you do have you know, something to consider, if you're traveling um, just you and the child for maybe a medical appointment, see about bringing an extra adult just through the gate check um, assistance. But really think about um, the adaptive stroller and the wheelchairs. And Jennifer, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that with your experience um, with, with wheelchair um, travel and getting to and through the airport and onto the plane. Um, two things, rewinding, because you were talking about TSA CARES, and we haven't used them to escort us through, but I have called them lots and they are wonderfully helpful for all of the questions. So if there's something that you're not sure that you can do or how to do it, I mean, even as you were just talking about bringing someone that can go through to gate check with you, I've never heard of that. I didn't know that was a thing. And so, so that's fantastic. There are so many things that 
aren't on your radar. And so you can call and you can ask all of those questions. I know you can read on the website that these liquids are allowed if they're medically necessary. But when you're packing your bag and then you're in line and you see all of the signs saying, if you have more than three ounces in your bottle, you must throw it away. I'm like, oh. so calling ahead of time is just helpful to go over, okay, what can we bring and what can't we? And really it's anything. We brought dish soap the one time because we needed it for my son's enema, which was a bit of a nightmare going through security because every single person was like, why do you need the dish soap? And I would explain how it makes your intestines contract and push the poop out. <laughs> and then they'd say, let me get my supervisor. We went through four rounds of that before they're like, just go. <laughs> right? Nobody wants to deal with the dish soap. Anyhow, um, accessibility wise. So my son uses a wheelchair and we go through, we do have TSA pre-check now, but we just got that this year. And it's kind of wonderful because I pay for myself and all three of my children are under me. So it's $80 for the four of us for the next four years. So it's a good deal for us. And I don't remember what age that cuts off. It might be 12 or somewhere, but mine are all 10 and under. Um, it takes a long time because of having the wheelchair. You do go in a separate line, which maybe it balances out. You skip the long line to go in the wheelchair line, but then they have to wipe down every bit of the wheelchair. They have to wipe down as much of the child as they can reach. Um, then they wipe my hands because I was touching the wheelchair. Apparently wheelchairs look like nice fluffy places to hide explosives. So they're super thorough, <laughs> um, which can be a little bit intimidating, but at this point we're used to it. You just plan extra time. Um, I think actually that's the biggest thing with the wheelchair. You just need to plan extra time. Same with medical liquids because they do scan everything. So even though it's allowed, it does have to go through the extra scanning process. So really with our TSA pre-check, I would think we balance out to be about the same as a person going through the regular line because we go through super quick and then we stop so that they can check all of the things. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I think about to um, the prior prioritizing boarding. Um, you know, yes, you can board the plane first um, and please take advantage of that. Um, you know, when you're traveling with young children or someone with a disabilities and needing extra time. Um, but I will tell you when my kids were younger, we actually did it a little bit backwards. We had my husband um, board first with the priority boarding. He would um, be strapped up with two car seats and head to our seats ahead of all of us. And I would um, actually be wearing two children. So I would baby wear or take a very small collapsible stroller and we would be the very last three people to board. And so that way he had enough time to get in, get the car seats on and my children didn't have a lot of extra time waiting on the plane. Um, so again, there's not an exact right or wrong way to do it, but just think about all options. Is it easier to be the very last ones on and then you just scoot in, buckle them up and off you go? Um, or do you want that extra time um, to, to be there? Um, one topic that came up um, in our survey and that's come up in our group is, is how much do you share, particularly with flight attendants? Um, how much do you share about seizures? Um, you know, and again, there's no exact right or wrong way to do it, but this is really based solely on your comfort letter, solely on your comfort level. Um, you're not required to disclose that medical information. And I could tell you um, that I've traveled both ways. When we first started traveling, we told the flight attendants, hey, this is what he has. He has a seizure disorder. This is um, if this happens, we can take care of it, but just so you know, and we would just be very forthcoming with all information. As we got into it a little bit more, we stopped saying so much. We knew um, his seizure patterns. We knew we could, if it would stop with rescue medication. And uh, we knew that that information was just for us. We didn't actually wanna put that worry, unnecessary worry on the rest of the flight crew. Um, we also got really good and are really good about not apologizing, but also just thanking people for their patience or thanking people for their assistance. Um, this might have to do with behaviors. I know a lot um, came through in our survey is how do you deal with behaviors on the plane? And I mean, that's a question for all, all parents, um, particularly parents of children with disabilities is how do you deal with these, you know, maybe if there's behaviors and I'm just a firm believer in I'm not going to apologize for my children being children or for a disability being a disability. And I'm just gonna thank people for, for their assistance or thank them for their understanding. So uh, think about 
something to consider is how much information you might um, share. Does does anybody have tips for dealing with um, dealing with time zones or jet lag? I was going to say only really the standard things of trying to keep them awake, which is horrible. So you're supposed to, you know, when you land on soil, you keep them awake on that time so that your body just skips all of that sleep you miss. <laughs> and that is what we have tried to do, but you can't stop them napping when they're that tired. I mean, I try screaming, shaking the child, you know, they're, they're just going to sleep if they're that tired. <laughs> but this is what you're supposed to do is just keep the child awake. Mm. Um, until they can switch to the new time zone. So we do our best with that and we soak in all the sunshine because the vitamin D is supposed to be great for you, but we have some cranky days. Well, and you know, for so many of us, uh, that sleep is so vital for seizure health too. So we really, I think this just goes along with, um, you know, we, we try to build in recovery days into our vacation too. We're not going to plan day one of heading out right from the start. We might need to make that our, our big relaxing day. Um, when we travel, we tend to um, stay in accommodations where we have our kitchen, have a kitchen. So we make that our grocery day and um, just our kind of our getting used to it all day. Um, I am not sure exactly on what's recommended medication wise is if you are sticking with your same uh, what your time is at home, but that's definitely something to talk with your medical professional about, especially if your child is sensitive, your individual is sensitive to um, the timing of their medications. But again, consulting with your your professional uh, medical team. One resource I've come across, and I don't know if anyone has ever used it, um, is the ARC's Wings for Autism and Wings for All. And this is a program that gives families and aviation professionals the confidence to take the skies with ease by providing an airport rehearsal, as well as a pre presentation on the aircraft features and in-flight safety pro protocols. Um, chapters of the ARC, local partners, and airport airline TSA personnel work collaboratively collaboratively to design and carry out each wings event. Um, this is not something I've ever participated in, but I have seen and I have heard about um, either here in our Seattle area of people participating in that. And I just wanted to put that out as another opportunity for families to partake in if you are looking at travel and want to try out this rehearsal if there is an, um, an event near you. Um, let's switch, let's get out of the skies and hit the road. Christy, I know you guys travel with a camper trailer, um, but these road trips, these camping trips, how do how does one get started thinking about even where to pack or, or how to organize for that event? Um, a, lo a lot of planning, <laughs> a lot of planning. Uh, and when you said like Santa, like make the list and check it twice, make the list and have two people check it twice um, and not verbally. Like I have to physically see it and check it uh, because we being the professionals that we are have forgot diapers. Um, <laughs> we got halfway through the trip and realized that when I asked my husband if it was, it, if the bin was underneath and he was like, yeah, I didn't fill the bin. Um, so the bin was there in the camper and it was not full and we ran out and we had to pay out of pocket a lot for big pull-ups. Um, so that's just an example of these things where you really have to have a list of all of the medical necessities. Um, I pack three times what we need in syringes, G-tubes, at least double for medications, probably three times for rescue meds. Um, and then think of everything you want to do on a trip and any gear that would make that easier or more accessible. Because if you're not having to fitted in suitcases on an airplane and you have the back of a truck and you have a camper that you can fill, you have the luxury of having more gear. Um, we bring a kinder pack. You'll see my husband carrying our son a ton on my page. It's like a backpack so that we can stretch accessibility. Uh, we don't go super far. People think we hike like out and back seven miles. That's insane. Uh, we don't go more than like a mile, but there are tons of trails that like Mesa Arch at Canyonlands is like 0.8 of a mile and it's beautiful, it's epic and it's not wheelchair friendly. And if you've ever tried carrying a disabled child while they're trying to you know, move all around and being floppy, that's just not easy. 
So that, a special needs life vest, a really big play yard so he can get down and stretch. These things are, are vital to making a trip um, go smoothly <laughs> so that you have all the equipment that you need. I think that's really important. And when we look at mapping, you have to know what your children are comfortable with as far as drive time. Um, I cannot tell you that. My son is obsessed with being in the truck. He likes the windows down and his hands out. I can plan from one stop to the next. If we want to go really far, we, we can drive 12 hours in a day. Robbie loves it. He naps on and off. And that's how, when you were saying like, oh, we have rest days. That's how we have rest days is we have really long travel days. So when everyone gets exhausted, we plan a long travel day and my husband gets no rest and everyone else naps. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how we do it. Um, I know a lot of families that are full-time RV families that don't even have the additional needs that our children do, and they don't travel more than three or four hours at a time. So I have a big map of the United States on my wall and it has all the national parks and state parks. And I just will look at it and go, okay, I think we can make like this far and this is kind of where we want to go. And what's something cool that we can stop and see on the way. And we usually start, we're in Colorado Springs and we'll make a big loop and then come back. But we've made it all the way to like the Canadian border twice last year. Um, up by Glacier National Park, and then by Washington. Excellent. You'll have to come even further out towards Washington soon. We have some beautiful parks out here. Yeah, we, we um, love Washington. Let's talk um, lodging tips. Hotels, Airbnbs, V, uh, I hear it on the commercial pronounced Verbo, even though I call it VRBOs. How, how do you navigate where to stay when you're traveling? Uh, so it, depending on if we're bringing our camper or not, we look at campgrounds that are very close to parks. Um, and that's just because my son falls asleep a lot in a vehicle. So you kind of have to know your child. Uh, if I want him to really be away for something, we can't be an hour away because he's going to start snoozing by the time that we get there. Um, recently this year, we started looking at, I call it VRBO as well, um, or Airbnbs. I prefer that over a hotel sometimes if we're traveling with the whole family. Uh, we have a six month old infant right now as well. So her and Robbie tend to wake each other up. <laughs> so being in a small RV or like a very small hotel room can have its own complications. Um, I will look again at a location and on those websites, you can filter by accessibility. Um, so that's always helpful. Sometimes we do, and sometimes we'll just look at the floor plan and say, you know what, this main area is accessible enough and he just doesn't need to go down the stairs to these other two rooms where our bigger kids are going to be. Um, we also sometimes do hotels. So I think it's just a matter of what's affordable and how long we're going to be at a location. Um, because in an RV, you pack it all in once and then all your stuff is there. But when you're going in hotels or Airbnbs, you're lugging all of this equipment in and out. So that in itself, you have to schedule time for. Melissa and Morgan, how, how about, oh, go ahead, Jennifer. It's okay. I was going to say, we use Home Exchange a lot, which also you can filter by accessibility and we pay a membership fee for the year, but then you can exchange endlessly. So like last year, we ended up paying $1.90 a night that we stayed because we were traveling enough to make it worthwhile. Um, the only thing I was going to comment on home exchange or Airbnb or hotel or whatever you do is communicating any needs you have um, because it's easy for somebody to throw on a label that it is accessible or that they have this thing and it's not really what you expect or what you actually need. And even hotels have a lot more available than you might think. So you can even ask for um, like the waterproof sheets for under your bedding. Um, there are a lot of things that ways that they can accommodate you if you are able to explain your needs. Even with accessibility, we've had to message homeowners um, to see what that actually means in their house because sometimes people are confused. And we actually stayed in a place in Croatia that was marked as wheelchair accessible. And it was, it was a flat. Um, everything was one level, zero entry to get in, but it was built into a hill where there were 30 steps up or down that you had to do to get into it. <laughs> so just being specific on your questions, um, I think it's always worth an email or a call to wherever you're saying to make sure that they actually have what you need. 
I will say that when we, we travel, we, um, we do have the privilege of um, having a timeshare. So we got into that before we started a family. And so we um, really like to be able to find places that have a two bedrooms because we like to be able to close the door. And for the longest time when the kids were little um, and before my son's nocturnal seizure started, the kids would sleep in the same bed. And recently um, we were doing some local staycationing and um, there was, there was two rooms, a master bedroom and another room with a queen. And we said, okay, you guys, you guys are going to sleep together. And my daughter who does not have the seizure said, um, can I have my own room? And I said, oh, okay, why? And she said, because it scares me when Lionel has seizures in his sleep. And that's, I mean, it, it broke my heart and we said, absolutely. And so we um, make sure that she now has her own room or we bed share. And so when we, our family recently flew to my um, hometown of Farmington, New Mexico, and um, my husband and my son spent the entire vacation in one bed and my daughter and I stayed in the other room in another bed. And it's just um, things to think about when you're outside of your comfort zone and, and what might have worked for one trip one year might not work for others. So um, she got the good room on the staycation. She got the one with the view and the queen bed and the built in lights in the, in the bed. So she was living it up on that vacation. And um, that kind of also leads to making sure that, um, you know, our son still naps because of all of his medications, despite being nine years old. And Thankfully, our seven-year-old daughter is still at a time where she will do a quiet time. But if not, we make sure that she gets to go out with a parent and do some other special things. So it may be a downer that, oh, we're on vacation. We have to come and do this nap time. But it doesn't mean it has to be for everybody. So we try to divide and conquer and make sure that um, maybe we're sleeping off a seizure, maybe we're just taking a nap, but the other parent, um, one parent and the other child can go do something. Or sometimes the parent, the other parent gets to go out and do something on their own and just have um, that time to do something. Morgan and Melissa, what about you? Any um, thoughts or tips for accommodations and lodging when you're traveling? We've done both. We've traveled or we've stayed in hotels. We've also stayed in like Airbnbs. It kind of depends on the length of the trip and where we're going to be staying and like what's available to us. Um, we do tend to bring the Sammy and I will say it is nice. He sleeps in bed with us at night because of his nocturnal seizures. But when we have multiple rooms it's really nice because we can put them on the sammy and then my husband and I can actually like have a conversation after he goes to bed or we can stay up a little bit later versus when you know you're all in one room you kind of all have to go to sleep at the same time we also travel a lot with the service dog and that has been an issue at a couple of airbnb and vrbo as I call it as well um, options, but they do have in their policy, in their official policy from the company that they do allow official service dogs. So if if an owner tries to tell you differently, go and research what, what the policy says and you can come back to them and have a conversation. We've had to do that multiple times before. It's always worked out fine. But um, it's just it's just been a thing that we have to consider. But it is nice to be able to stay at more of like a residence, especially if it's going to be longer and we have the dog with us as well. So then, you know, it's easier to be able to take her out and stuff versus being in a hotel. I was going to say the same, you know, um, for us, it's not just about planning for our son with DS, but also making sure that everybody else is going to have a good time and that there isn't going to be any regrets on their end. So for us, it's worth it to find a place that has, you know, maybe a kitchen or something that they can do if we do have to sleep off a seizure or if we decide that we're just going to kind of have a rest day or for us, overstimulation is a big thing for our son. We, we might not necessarily see, see a seizure, but we might see behaviors increase. 
increase. And so maybe we don't want to wait in that two hour line for the restaurant that sounded really good. And we're going to grab a pizza instead and cook it at the place. So we, um, we tend to do more Airbnb or VRBO um, options just because it's more comfortable for everybody um, when we do that. And, and I think the kids, you know, when we bring our older boys as well, they have a space that they can kind of have their own. Um, we don't, I don't feel that pressure of like, oh, they're jumping on the bed. They're jumping from this to this. And they're, you know, it's, it's just fun. <laughs> I will say that we recently stayed at a hotel and we haven't done a hotel in a long time. And when Robbie is nonverbal, but he is very loud and he was being very loud at like 2 a.m. And my husband and I were like mortified um, because I'm like, oh man, like I saw them put someone in this room behind us and they're not going to know what this noise is. Um, and now our dog is barking <laughs> because he travels with us. Um, so that is really good. And then also a tip um, for doing things separately. We, if we are going to stay somewhere in town, we really like to stay within walking distance. Um, it saves our back not having to put the wheelchair in and out of a vehicle multiple times. So we recently went to Glenwood Springs and we were walking distance to the Cavern Adventure Park. Um, Robbie got tired halfway through and I was able to strap on um, a baby carrier. I put my daughter in it. I left her stroller parked in a little corner up there uh, with TJ and our daughter and they just pushed it down empty hours later. And I was able to then bring my baby and Robbie back to the hotel. We walked back by ourselves. We were like half a mile away. They got to have a nap. He sleeps in a, a portable safety sleep layer, uh, which that's really nice. So we were able to get that seizure nap in um, and then he, he was ready to go and they got back. It, she was bored for five minutes instead of for two hours and we went to a hot spring. So I think planning like that um, for your other children and like we ask before every trip, what do you want to do when we're in this area? And I'll pull up like the top 10 things to do in an area. And if she wants to go horseback riding and that's not something that Robbie can do, then we'll plan that around when he might be tired. Excellent. Those are all really great tips. Um, I'm going to take a look. We have one. Let me get back here. It takes me just a second to go through these steps. Another comment from my children is, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? So we are almost at the end of our um, session. So I want to go to our questions from the chat. And I see that we have a question on um, thoughts on changing a diaper on a plane if needed and how to avoid changing diapers on a flight, especially for older or taller kids. Um, Jennifer, you mentioned incontinence. Do you have anything you would kind of guide us there on? Nothing that I really like. So we changed sitting up on the toilet in the restroom on the plane. Um, I mean, the changing tables, you know, are meant for baby babies. Our son is seven and he's already twice the size of a changing table. So he is able to sit up on his own and then we're able to finagle around to change a diaper on the toilet. Um, we have also, if we have our own row, we've changed them just laying down on the flight seats. Um, that's the best I've got. <laughs> I've, um, I, I've heard a tip and this was through um, a webinar with Courageous Parents Network and um, people advised, uh, this was something that they talked about when you're boarding the plane is talking to a flight attendant um, ahead of time because depending on the exact plane, they may prefer for you to change in the front, they may prefer for you to change in the back. Um, one family said that their flight attendants were able to um, give them kind of body shields of privacy and that um, they, it was not the preferred, obviously not the preferred thing, just like when you're changing any child, but they um, brought a, a blanket that almost has like the rubber bottom and um, laid it on the floor where the head, where the child, the adult, sorry, the individual was, um, had the bottom going into the bathroom. So there was still some privacy there um, and to be able to lay down to change in that fashion. Again, 
I think it's nothing that anyone really wants to do, but talking with your flight crew ahead of time. And even um, one of the parents in the, the webinar I participated in had said, um, you know, just explaining to the rows ahead of you and behind you, just taking five minutes of embarrassment to say, hey, you know, this this might happen. We thank you in advance for your um, for your understanding with this. And we're just we're going to navigate it the best that we can. Um, so I, again, I think that's something just making sure that you're, you're checking with your flight crew because they might have some tips for that too. Um, I'm looking here, um, for, would the plane do an emergency landing in the case of a status seizure? Um, I will, I can only answer this based on what I've looked at, um, for different airlines and talking with pilots that I know. Um, the pilot has the ultimate decision in, in making sure that the, the crew is safe. Um, so I, um, from my understanding, if you are having a status seizure and the seizure is not stopping, then yes, you can claim a medical emergency and the, and the, the, they would go through their procedures that they're trained on, on, um, contacting the, the medical team that they have um, connections to. But if there is a status seizure, and even if you think it's going to stop, or you're not, um, you know, if you're more at like that four minute mark, and you know, they always end at four, that it's possible that the pilot may also choose to land the plane, um, just again, because he is, he or she is ultimately in charge of the, the safety. So that's not an exact yes or no answer. Um, my, my best um, guidance would be to to look directly at the air um, the airlines um, medical emergency information or talk to someone specifically at that airline because they may have different procedures. Um, finally, I know we've been talking mainly about um, domestic travel. Um, Jennifer mentioned a little bit with some international, but any advice or thoughts or suggestions on traveling internationally? Um, we have not yet traveled internationally with our family. Um, we're not quite ready for that. Um, it's on the horizon one day, um, but does anybody have any specific tips or guidance there? The only thing that I would highlight is actually what Christy was already talking about with packing for a road trip and making sure that you have all of the things. Um, in Europe, they don't make the same things that we have here. And so we had an issue where we ran out of catheters for the enema and there was no such product there. So just making sure that you have all of the things there because I mean, to ship from the States to any other country is not only a fiasco in time, but in finances. Um, so making sure that you really have all of the medical things that you could need. And I know Christy was talking about packing like three times as much as you need, um, which is hard when you're flying and you're checking bags. We actually bring bags that will fit inside of each other because we go with a lot of diapers and syringes and catheters and enema bags, whatever. And we come home with none of that. So we can go with three suitcases and come home with one if we can fit them all inside of the big one that we brought. Um, I think those are probably my biggest things that you can pack your bags in and make sure you have all the stuff. I think the same with the medications, you know, not knowing if your medication is available in that other country um, or if it's called a, a different name. Um, again, just making sure you're prepared for all the things. So I'm, I'm sorry that we don't have more advice and, and thoughts for international travel, but in our online support group, we can certainly, I know that there's many that have traveled internationally um, and we can keep that um, topic going um, there in the group. I will add one other thing, because I know you were talking about families that do keto and my oldest son actually has nephrotic syndrome, which means he can't have salt when he's having a relapse. And so there are things where we'll learn certain words in the languages of the places that we're going, like if there are dietary mm -hmm. needs. So if there's something that you might need to be able to communicate in that language, so whether it's about a seizure or if it's about a medication or a dietary need, maybe learning some key phrases before you go so that if you're in a situation, you have that. Really excellent tip. Um, like I said, unfortunately, I knew we wouldn't cover everything. We could sit and still talk more about um, all of our different tips, our horror stories. Someday I'll share the story about how I had to 
head to Morgan's house at four or five in the morning from my California destination because our seizure dog had run out of food and our Amazon package didn't order, but I'll save that for another day. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up now. Oh, in just a moment, I will wrap it up when I adequately share my screen. If you have any questions regarding this topic or anything presented tonight, please email info at dravetfoundation.org or to me directly at erin at dravetfoundation.org. Again, I'd like to thank our DSF Family Network parent ambassadors, Melissa O'Brien and Morgan Turpin for sharing their experiences with us here tonight. Thank you to Christy Cook with Accessible Adventures and to Jennifer Allen with Wonders Within Reach. Please visit their websites, accessibleadventures.net and wonderswithinreach.com, as well as follow them on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and YouTube. Finally, I'd like to once again thank our sponsors for their support of this educational webinar series. Thank you to BioCodex, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Takeda, and UCB. Again, this session has been recorded and along with the slide deck will be available later on demand. Thank you for joining us tonight and we wish you many safe travels. Good night.